Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, How are you? I think we go good. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. I think we'll go ahead and start. Um, sure. We have a, a number of people waiting, and and we're on time. So, um, welcome everybody. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Good afternoon. From wherever all of you are joining, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Pursipun Zindagi's Essential Counseling Skills Launch today. Uh, this is a toolkit that is designed to coping with stress management. And we'll talk a little bit more about what toolkit is and the, the importance of mental health uh, in the workspace. Before I begin, I'd just like to show a very quick video about IRD and Pursukun Zindagi and what the mental health program is. introduce our panelists. We have Imran Baksamusta. Imran is the CEO of BlueX. He is an entrepreneur who built Pakistan's first cash on delivery service at BlueX. He also uh, is, is part of the founding team at Brandverse, where he serves as its COO. Um, Imran is alumnus of the University of Toronto with the Masters in Mathematics. Uh, welcome, Imran. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Hello. Dr. Thanks Sahar. for having me. Dr. Sahar Nadeem Hamid is the chairperson of the Social Sciences and Liberal Arts Department and a faculty member at the IBA, as well as a cognitive psychologist. Thanks for joining us, Sahar. Thank you. I, I, do, I do need to regret um, Dr. Ifat from Sihakani was supposed to join us today as well, but there's been a death uh, in the family and she was unable to attend uh, for that reason. So uh, we, we begin the panel. The reason we're here, uh, the reason we thought we would um, have this conversation uh, is because we all are aware of the mental health gaps in Pakistan. Uh, repeatedly, we hear it everywhere all the time. The need for mental health services is very high. The service provision is very low. There just aren't enough healthcare practitioners, providers, researchers, clinicians who are working on mental health at the scale and capacity at which we need uh, to, to see it, to be able to meet the demand of, of the teams. That is one of the reasons why IRD's mental health program, as you had seen in the video earlier as well, a uh, snapshot of it, uh, that's one of the reasons why we built a community-based model uh, to be able to uh, develop capacity of people to be able to part the reach more people and essentially increase accessibility to mental health care. Um, we've put together this toolkit, which we are uh, calling the Mind Kit, um, which is essentially an entire package where we, um, where we are able to build the capacity of people in essential counseling skills. Um, this will equip people to be able to provide frontline therapy for mild to moderate depression and anxiety. So we're very excited about it and we're very excited to hear about the needs of various sectors um, and what more can be done in addition to this, what is being done and what more can be done and what the needs are. So I'd like to jump right into our questions. Um, um, we'll start, I'll, we'll start, I'll ask a question and we'll give each of the panelists a chance to respond. 
Um, also, we I would request our audience, if you have a question, please feel free to either write it in the chat box or um, write it in the Q&A box. And there will be time towards the end if you would like to ask it verbally as well. Um, OK, so starting off with you, Imran, what are the existing gaps in mental health care in your industry, in the corporate sector? What do you see as some of the larger mental health gaps? Um, so first of all, I'd like to say that uh, in BlueX and Brandverse combined, right? Um, uh, we've been uh, dealing with about, we, we employ about more than 1500 people across the board, right? And uh, throughout my entire career, which has been about spanning more than 15 years, we've never seen uh, this topic being addressed, right? But we've always seen um, people struggling with it, right? Uh, majority of it is basically um, catered to through uh, the organization's HR function, but the worst part is that the HR function itself is not equipped to deal with these things. So whenever there's a problem that arises, most of the times it's either uh, dealt with by giving more money, right? Or it's dealt with basically giving more money, right? Even though people have a lot of different types of issues when they're working for an organization, right? They could start with uh, family. They could be um, uh, for the sake of not having uh, enough time, a lot of work pressures uh, building up, them not being able to balance their life out, uh, but all and the way we try and solve these issues is uh, by understanding what the financial reasoning is, but everything else is not even addressed. And this is what I've seen over the span of 15 years. So initially when I'd met uh, you guys from IRD, right, and the program that we heard about, um, I thought this is a right fit. We actually going over the program that you guys were pitching to us also, we figured something out that this is completely lacking, uh, at least in the corporate sector. In fact, it's a taboo to talk about this. Even the employees are afraid to broach this topic with their employers because they feel like it'll have a negative ramification on their career while the workplace or the employers actually need to realize is that if this is addressed, there'll be an overall productivity gain probably uh, at the workplace and the organization. Okay, having uh, saying all of this, I would also like to let everyone know that I am not an authority like the other panelists are, uh, right, on this topic. And certain times uh, during this entire conversation, I might not even be politically correct because I come from the business diaspora, so please uh, excuse myself in advance. Um, but yes, I feel like this is something that absolutely needs to be addressed. It's something that we um, are exposed to. In fact, I would like to give a little bit of a story of the first time that I got exposed to something like this extremely indirectly. And it, it wasn't at my workplace, it was when I was really young. Um, when I was 17, I was exposed to a car accident. Uh, it was really bad, right? I'd fractured my spinal cord, et cetera. There were three people in the car, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the driver and the passenger, which was me and my friend, uh, we were in the hospital and had a three month recovery physically, et cetera, right? And the third guy who was in the car, uh, in the back seat, he'd gone home the same day from the hospital, right? Three months later, we rejoined school. Um, we come in and stuff like that. And uh, the third guy who had gone home the same day was extremely upset. Because when we rejoined school, they announced it in the assembly and they said, oh, welcome back, guys, this, that, et cetera, right? And this guy came up to me, and I remember this still today, and I understood it years later. And I thought that he was uh, so obnoxious for saying something like that. But he came up to me and he goes like, listen, um, uh, your hurt and your injuries are all physical and everyone can see it. And so they're being addressed. What I had to deal with for the last three months was internal. And no one actually saw that until today you're being cheered on for coming back and I still haven't gotten over it, right? So it's this thing that was the first time I think without even knowing I was exposed to a mental health issue. And years later, I kind of figured out that, oh my God, that implication, that ramifications actually stayed with him. My physical injuries healed, but the mental ones no one could see. And you know, in Pakistan, more so than other places, we are a busy big society, right? What you see is what you get. We're, 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 we're ingrained with that sort of thought process. And because we haven't been exposed to tools to cope with the mental health at a young age, just like I wasn't, right? So I never saw that friend. And in fact, uh, I think we drifted apart after that entire statement that you made to me, right? Even though not realizing, because I wasn't equipped to handle that, that translates into the workplace, right? As we grow, grow older. 
And so therefore I feel there is a real urgent need to address this. And the main thing is to remove that taboo between the employer and the employee. So this conversation can start taking place at the workplace. That's incredible, Imran. Thank you so much. No, and, and that's also very profound um, and also highlights so many different things. One is, of course, the productivity and the, the lens with which we look at it, but also it highlights the importance of early, earlier on talking about uh, mental health, even at the age of school. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a traumatic event like an accident. It can also be smaller things that happen to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Sahar, I want to ask you the uh, same question for your sector. Uh, what do you think are the existing gaps in mental health care in the educational sector in which you've been involved for the last several years? Uh, so within the education sector, so I've usually uh, been involved with universities. So those are uh, young adults coming in. Uh, but I think there is a huge shortage all over the world in taking care of young adults uh, when they're coming in it's it's a very sensitive sort of time period. Uh, they, for a lot of them, they may be leaving their home for the first time. They may be experiencing independence for the first time. So a lot of things in their life are changing. And along with that comes the pressure of entering university. And I think over there, a lot of the things that are put into place are uh, sort of after something goes wrong, what can you do to help a student? And I think that is a little bit too late. We need to develop communities within um, educational areas where the focus is more on preventative. How do you make an environment safe and healthy for people coming in so that they don't, so that something, they don't reach a limit when they actually need help. So before things get bad, how can you put in little interventions that can help them cope with things? And I think that needs to start from your early years not just university, but from your early years, because, you know, kids who may overtly be looking fine, smiling and happy, there must, there might be a lot of things going on and they might not know how to cope with them. And if we could put in those little interventions early on, give them the skills to talk about things, uh, you know, let their friends know if somebody is talking about things, how can you be a supportive friend, what a teacher is supposed to do, because a lot of times your faculty and especially with early years, the teachers may not be skilled to know what to do when they hear something or they see a student in trouble. They may want to help, but they just don't know what to do about it. And so if we, we can train our teachers, if we can train our staff, that would really help uh, make the environment better. And then once, if, you're, if your mental health is healthy, everything else will work better. If mentally you are not healthy, everything will be impacted in your life. Your attention is impacted. Your ability to complete tasks is impacted. If you're enjoying things is impacted, how your relationships cope, everything is impacted. So it's not just one thing. There's a huge knock-on effect. So we really, uh, in education, I feel we really need to look at preventative measures and starting as early as possible and also informing people as to what kind of uh, options and help are needed. Because a lot of times in mental health care, you don't need really big things. It's the smaller things put into place early on, which can so resolve a lot of the problems that are available, that are uh, common, uh, commonly happening. And I feel, Arita, what you said about trauma, I think that's very important as well. A lot of times, uh, people sort of ignore or belittle um, a lot of traumas because they feel it's not big enough, right? You know, something really big and grand. But trauma is trauma. And it doesn't matter trauma if it was large or small. If, if it made you feel a certain way, then it is equally serious and it should be taken care of. Because um, uh, I was at a pan another panel recently and somebody was talking about um, a natural disaster and the trauma that they uh, that impacted them. And somebody responded, but your trauma isn't as bad as XYZ's trauma, which went through like a bigger natural disaster. And you know, that, that statement right there, it was, uh, I was really, it, it really jarred me. Ke, 
you know, you don't compare trauma. You have, to, and so if at educational institutes as well, you know, if somebody is opening up and telling you about something, and then it's compared that, नहीं नहीं आपको तो शुक्र करना चाहिए आप तो बहुत बेहतर है. We have to, we have to change the way we think about mental health. We should be putting in things really early on, and we should be more supportive with each other. And and I feel it's not in academia. A lot of focus is on students, but your staff also needs a lot of help. they are also dealing with a lot of things a lot of times you know a students uh, issues a, a staff member will also suffer from them because you know you might be failing somebody who's going through a hard time and you're in that tough position ke you know my marks sirf iste de dun because i feel sorry for them but they don't deserve them so where do you go to sort of talk about those issues how do you learn how to cope with those issues so nobody actually talks about the faculty members so much because they're also going through a lot so it always has to be a two pronged approach in in academia at least absolutely and in fact i would add to that sahar i think the the parents are also another it's the students is the faculty and it's also the parents who play a critical role in in the whole dynamic so you know sahar to um, to have i have a follow up question for you uh, there's many things that you mentioned in in your response what what are one or two things that you think specifically healthcare institution as well not healthcare educational institutions so the universities can do specifically to address the mental health gap there are many things you mentioned that i said and uh, some of it are perhaps outside of their um what they're able to do but what would you recommend to be the one or two most critical things so for me the first thing would be developing a space where students feel safe and and faculty as well so a safe space for me is very important and then um, so if you have that kind of safe space a student or faculty member can uh, actually show their problems there which is step one so you don't have to hide this that kind of environment is very important a university counseling center cannot cater to everything it can only be a sign post thing it can cater to smaller issues because once you leave university you can't keep on using university uh, wellness center right so it is about providing the basic ways of helping yourself in a long term way uh, if you need more help guiding you to who you need to go because mental health occurs at levels right everybody is treating a different level which is important in its own right and people need to be more informed about what level of help they need who should they be going to because that information is also missing so people don't know what level of help they need who should they be going to should they be going to a counselor a psychiatrist so i think that kind of education should be happening in educational institutes as well so you know what kind of help you need and a lot more uh i think you know you, with your your kind of program that task sharing because you know you're with peers so if you can sort of um have workshops where students who are interested can learn these kind of skills so when they're around their peers they can see okay this person might need a little bit more help how can i be more supportive or how can i sort of guide them to go and get some help without being too pushy so the training is really important you don't overdo it because that's also another problem but well trained people within that peer environment just developing that supportive empathetic environment where people feel safe i think that's key and then spreading the right kind of information Hey, okay, thanks so much, Sar. And Imran, to ask you the same questions, uh, what do you think um, the corporate sector can do? What can employers do uh, to help to minimize these mental health care gaps? The first thing is, I think we should build a corporate-wide framework that can address training for um, our own staff. Uh, specifically, if you ask me, so I'm a very functional sort of CEO, right? um i would start with human resources right and i wouldn't really start with an angle of training my human resources to further help the staff but i would actually start with my human resources in the problems that they face in mental health right so sort of like lead by example to make them understand because i feel like there's uh, within my own structure within my own hr they themselves have inflicting issues right 
how are they supposed to help others if they haven't yet sorted out their own issues classical like you know um uh, therapy right so you got to solve it first in order for you to be able to you know um uh, so it has to be reconciled within your own head so convincing the right people in an organization because obviously if you have like a thousand plus people organization that you're dealing with you can't go out there and suddenly start training everyone i don't even think there's an entire supply of counselors out there who could actually handle an organization of different sizes right so it'd be like sort of like teach the trainer sort of an approach to this right obviously the uh, uh, i mean you have to be really careful i'm not an expert in this right but if there are certain uh, um key functional traits that can be imparted in terms of handling this i know someone can't become a counselor overnight or over a week or even a year right uh, it takes time uh, but we could maybe start off and jot down the uh, the most common points that actually employees go through and then maybe address those and then go forward and also looking at the type of work that the organization is in uh so for example uh blue x right we are a operational heavy organization uh majority of our staff i would say about uh 70% of it is made up of couriers and delivery uh people right and so they come from a certain income uh segment they come from a certain uh a, a part of society right which which uh, um uh, which is predisposed to different uh, uh or exposed to different sort of uh, uh um um experiences right um and and so it has to be tailor made to address that particular thing so now for example a courier right he has different pressures at work and he has different pressures at home as opposed to a manager would so his pressure for example at work is the speed and time of delivery and every day there might be a manager who's hounding him and then he goes back home and he has the same sort of pressures coming up from his household maybe he's not making enough ends meet right or maybe there's some something which has nothing to do with any of that right that's that's basically um, uh, uh, not letting him uh, settle into his workplace etc so we also have to look at the makeup of the organization and the type of trade that that organization is in and then probably come up with sort of like a framework that can address these issues so so it has to be tailor made um i think it can't be company wide it has to be that the key personnel within the organization get trained and then we go forward from there so that's sort of like how um i would deal with this um, um issue going forward yeah sure so sure. that's a great point we can definitely not have a one size fits all approach uh, just because the the sector is so varied so imran a follow up question for you what do you think uh, are some of the major obstacles that broadly prevent the corporate sector from integrating mental well being i mean exposure to the entire field of uh, i guess therapy and uh, you know this conversation that never happens so i'll give you a small example from my own life uh, up until i myself had gone into therapy i always thought oh wait um, you know it's, it's it's someone who's really weak who I, and i'm being very crass about this but it's someone who's really weak or has a weakness that you have to go to therapy to solve wherein you don't realize that this is a part of the process right and it has to constantly keep happening and it's not whether you have an issue or not that you go into therapy right it's a constant process of uh, think of it as an employee who upgrades his skill sets every year so it has to be a constant process and a constant change because life keeps changing uh, situations around you keep changing you never know what's going to affect you right so this uh, the, the greatest barrier is like uh, taking this taboo out of this entire topic um at least at the workplace and in the corporate sector because again i'll tell you um there's a lot of politics also involved in in, in the workplace etc right so this just adds on to it so imagine i don't think there is any organization where an employee right now and as dr sahar also pointed out that you need to create these safe spaces right so i don't think any organization even in the multinational uh, consumer packaged goods companies etc there is any safe space where you can actually just walk up to your hr right and tell them that this is this is this is there's this um uh, mental sort of uh, uh, inhibition or something that's inflicting me and i don't think any employee is going to have that conversation with his employer because the minute you do that majority of the organizations and this i'm telling you from my own organization might red flag you and so not having that safe space not having that sort of uh, workflow built into the 
entire framework of your human resources is a big inhibitor in sort of uh, letting this go. So I think before we start anything, before we even lay down a framework or start working about this, I think the conversation has to start of not making it such a taboo uh, topic. And then we go from there. But uh, it has to be basically, yeah, so awareness has to be created and from awareness, everything else will move through. So I guess organizations like uh, IRD, et cetera, I mean, we need to see more of this. Uh, by the way, before I got approached uh, from you guys, I think uh, I, I had no idea there were programs like this. And we didn't know for us, human resource capability was just reliant on the HR guy who studied from a university and nothing to do with mental health or et cetera, mm -hmm. which I feel is such a big topic, mm -hmm. such a big topic. Even I'll tell you something, even illnesses can be prevented. I feel like mm -hmm. hypertension, right? Hypertension is a product of uh, uh, a lot of pressures that people feel at work, mm -hmm. at home. So, so, so there's a lot of, so, so I feel it would be highly beneficial for an organization to look into this and in fact, to have programs that invest in this. But again, before we start all of this, the basic awareness level has to be created. Absolutely. Thanks, Iman. We like to think of ourselves as being the pioneers of this, or at least one of the very few organizations that are, that are working on this. But, you know, as I said earlier, the need is so high. Anyone who does uh, even a little bit has, has a lot of impact. So, um, so thank you for that. And I agree with you. This is even the work that we've seen at the community level with training counselors, that when people go door to door and work at the community level, um, the people and clients are willing to talk. It's usually the decision makers and the people in positions of power who need to be convinced of the need for it. So even in the corporate sector, it's your upper management. So I'll, I'll, Anita, I'll also tell you this one small anecdote, right? So a lot of times in my organization, and, and as a joke, we've said it again, I'm, I'm sure, I, don't, I don't mean to be insensitive or anything, but uh, a lot of the times when we're speaking about HR uh, and we, we, we're, we're pulling our hair out and we're like, oh, yeah, wo, eh, HR is not usko uh, yaar, HR head ke ga therapist, it's a big set of our human resources, right? But that in itself says a lot. That a lot of the problems that we have and controlling these organizations, I know for a fact, a lot of the problems that we have don't stem from the fact that there's a structural issue in the organization. Mm -hmm. It's like a thought process. It's streamlining. It's people having their own personal issues, which actually then come into the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm, and again, I'm purely talking from a corporate angle, right? Mm -hmm. So, so absolutely, these programs are required. And and this this anecdote is like, and I'm I'm telling you this. It happens in a lot of organizations because an organization is built with people. So, ninety percent of the problems that we are solving is either for the people or by the people right or they are created by people so therefore it's a very very important component it does um sahar coming back to you you know a lot of times educational institutions have one or two counselors for students as you had mentioned yourself um and again the as you said the need is so high that sometimes this isn't enough how do you think a task shifting approach can be beneficial or provide an opportunity for educational institutions I think task shifting is is key. We can, as an educational institute, I don't think we can ever have, and you know, you don't just need counselors. Again, the levels of mental health care, you need uh, an entire team to take care of mental health. And, you know, we have to look at our resources at a university and it, in most cases, it will never be possible to hire enough skilled trained people, even if you find them, which is also another difficulty. So uh, task shifting is key. Uh, universities are full of young, eager students who want to learn and they're interested, they're there for you. They want to, they are excited about this. They just need proper training. Uh, one of the things I always say, so I'm a psychologist and I've been teaching uh, intro to psychology courses for like 15 years now. And the first thing I tell them is, you know, when you sit in this class, you will not step out a psychologist. So don't uh, try to diagnose people and don't try to treat people uh, because you can't. Uh, you need a lot more training. And that, but but every in every one of those classes, I see this like 50, 60 extremely eager students who are so excited about it and they want this proper kind of training and they want to go out and help. And so if we're task shifting, 
we never had the resources to hire enough uh, people for a wellness center university. We can only hire about, say, a team of three or four. But then when you have all these eager students, task shifting is the key, right? So for the smaller issues where you don't need um, higher level help, we can train students who will be there. They can be there as mentors, um, uh, especially for students you know, who are leaving their homes and coming. If you have a mentor there, and I'm saying you have a mentor there before something goes wrong. You know, you know this. these students are coming in it's the first time they're moving to a city or they're living independently for the first time. Give them a mentor. The mentor just helps them with, you know, this is how university life is. This is how you can cope with classes, learning skills, things like that. Simple things. Nothing has gone wrong yet, but this is just a preventative measure. And with task shifting, if you put this in right when a student enters university, you would make their entire journey a lot easier and safer and nicer. It'll be sort of somebody to turn to as soon as you step in. Because it can be very overwhelming, you know, you're trying to cope with this new way of learning and then trying to be an adult as well, which on its own is extremely difficult. And I think it's the same thing with your younger years education as well. Again, schools can only have a finite number of counselors. And students will have a lot of different needs. So we're not only, so, you know, we have to look at differences in uh, learning needs, right? Kids will have different ways of learning. How do you cater to that? Um, then there will be kids who may have issues at home. And how do you cater to that so that they can learn well in, in a school environment? Uh, then there may be kids who are having issues in school. So there are so many varied kind of issues that your team of two or three counselors cannot cope with all of them. So if you use task shifting, then you're providing, you're reducing the stress on your counselors, first of all, so they can actually cope with the more uh, serious, like not more serious, but the ones who need their help more. So they're free, freed up for that. And then the other ones who may not need that kind of help can be helped with the task shifting, properly trained pairs around them that could be there to support them. And then people who need even more can be guided towards uh, other avenues of help, may, which may not be in the university or school that you're in. So signposting you to where the help is needed, because I think that's extremely important. No, thank you. And I think that um, I know, at least in the Pakistani context, this isn't being done at, in, a, in a systematic or programmatic way to kind of look at what are the entry points, where are the places within schools where when university students come in, where it can be done. So maybe definitely an opportunity even for IRD to think about ways in which that can be done. Um, Imran, I want to turn back to you. Um, you had earlier mentioned about productivity. Um, and I'm interested to know how you think that investing in human capital, mental health, in the way that we're hoping to do, um, how that can um, impact productivity in a way that makes this interesting for corporates. So, you know, um, the thing, innovation only happens when you're well fed, right? So in the same way, if um, you won't find a lot of innovation coming from a lot of the poor countries in the world, right? Um, same way, uh, an employee, if he can't concentrate completely on work and he's got a lot of issues of his own or inflicting issues from his family, et cetera, and he can't deal with those, uh, how is he uh, able to deal with his work? So that it's a pure direct correlation. Whenever we have solved problems for employees, um, so again, telling you that without even realizing, right? Uh, might be that there's some issue that he can't deal with, with uh, uh, being, so for example, being married at a very young age, taking on the pressures of work, et cetera, and all of that gets fully loaded, right? And then his performance for, let's say, in the career world for delivery is affected. So a, a lot of the times, without even knowing, I know for a fact we've solved certain issues, right, um, that were inflicting their um, uh, uh, mental headspace. And we've always seen it come back with a greater sense of productivity, right? A greater sense of ownership of his work. And then he, 
and this I'm again being very careful in telling you guys that without us knowing when there's been positions where we've solved issues. So now imagine that we have a program within the organization which actually addresses these issues and then pointedly has a very open door policy about the fact that employees can walk in and discuss things uh, which, which is besides their salaries, et cetera. Uh, we feel very confident that this would actually help. Um, and I'm telling you again, being in uh, a position where uh, uh, we've led uh, two companies, um, a lot of the times when employees come in, um, it, it is a lot of personal issues that they come in with that they want resolved from their uh, workplace. And uh, more so uh, in Pakistan than a lot of other countries. Um, so I'm telling you this 80%, I would say, of my work is actually dealing with people within the organization and making sure that their headspace is clear so that they are able to perform for the organization. Um, so yeah, so so in a very sort of um, um, well, selfish way, I would say that, yeah, for the organization itself, if they uh, had a clear headspace, if they were able to deal with their personal lives a lot better, or if they were equipped to deal with it, or they could come to someone within the organization to actually get guidance on how to deal with it, or actually start healing themselves in a few uh, places, a few things that were afflicting their mental health, I think uh, productivity levels in the organization as a general would go up. Thanks, thanks, Imran. Um, Sahar, my last question for you uh, before we open up questions from the audience. So I would really encourage anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, please do um, get ready to ask them. We're just going to ask uh, Sahar our last question. Sahar, you had talked about, uh, you know, you had said something about how a lot of times uh, the students in, in first year intro to psych are very interested in quickly becoming psychologists and getting those skills. What, what are the key skills and, um, and responsibilities that you think are the most critical to impart at an early, at an early, uh, early on, essentially, you know, we're talking about our shifting a lot. And in your, um, since you are a technical expert, what do you think are the most important skills and responsibilities someone should know, everybody should know for that approach? Um, so I would say, first of all, uh, keeping an open mind and actually listening to what the person is saying and not just listening to what you perceive the person is saying. I think that's very important. Um, also, lack of judgment is very important. You don't have to agree with things. You can have ha difference of opinion, difference of ideas is fine, but you have to be respectful and the judgment doesn't help at all. So being properly informed, coming in with, with I guess, good listening ears where you're actually hearing the problem and not just assuming that it is something that you perceive is happening but actually listening to what the other person is saying and not coming in with judgment. Uh, I think that's very important. And that, with the, and that means that, you know, people can have a different point of view. If people can have a different opinion or ideas or beliefs, and that's okay. You don't have to agree with them. They don't have to agree with you. And that's fine. You don't have to sort of convert people over to your side or your way of thinking. I think that is, also important um, again also being very careful uh, and and being open to different uh, different point of views that it's just I think within all mental health skills number one is being a very good listener and trying to be empathetic uh, trying to be kind and trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes while you're listening so you can be there in a better way um, but also being realistic in a way so I think you know there is stigma but there is also a lot of misinformation about what a mental health specialist can do for you uh, I mean the uh, Hollywood movies and things like that portray us in a very strange kind of light and so people may come in thinking okay, you know you, you're going to a therapist pele session where they're going to give you the answer to all, all your problems and then they get annoyed that by the third session, they're not, they're not telling me the answer. And it's sort of like informing people that that's not their job. It's about giving you the skills to find your own answers. 
सो एक्सपेक्टेशन दोनों साइड से थोड़ी मैनेज होने की जरूरत है because i get a lot of students who come in and they say no you send me to the counselor i went to the counselor and they didn't give me any answer <laughs> but that that's not what they do but that expectation of what they're supposed to do is so wrong in a lot of cases which is again due to lack of knowledge so informing on both sides i think is very important to actually know what a mental health specialist can do for you what the different levels can do for you and which one is appropriate for you and if you are going into mental health then sort of being a very good listener and giving your judgment at home yeah no absolutely i think in this whole process there's also a process of unlearning uh, hmm. what you have already learned and where you've reached a kind of realizing a self realization that that isn't the best way forward and so um, even in our casting skills we in the manual itself also we tried to actually incorporate, incorporate some of this how do you bring people to realize within themselves what um, what works and what doesn't and what works for the other person but i think you've also raised a really critical point about expectations because you're right we do need to um, even before counseling starts as part of the consent process actually explain what you're going to get out of this um at the community level because there's just all types of um all types of ideas in people's heads so i'm going to, i'm going to now open it up to um questions from the audience i see there are about six um so i will just read them out and then um we can we can so both can take a shot at them so uh, dr pashmin nathani is asking you are reaching out to layman individuals or mental health professionals I think she might be talking about the toolkit itself, the Persuqun Zindagi toolkit. So, uh, Dr. Nathani, we are reaching out to layman uh, individuals, not mental health professionals, because this is a task shifting model, a community based program. We are taking people from within communities and training them to be counselors. So, we ask that they have 13 years of education. But other than that, um, we don't require any other professional training from them to be able to uh, go through the counseling training. There's a question from Ariba. Um, the question is stemming from Imran's comment that mental health problems are routed to HR, and HR doesn't have that capacity either. Would you suggest that HR should be sensitized towards mental health problems first? If so, how can leadership of corporates help in this initiative? Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I said. That HR first needs to realize themselves and the need to be sensitized towards this, and I think. through awareness programs this adapt process can start off uh but anita i would leave it up to you and dr sahar to as professionals to better uh respond to this question sahar would you would you like to respond sorry could you repeat the question <laughs> uh the question is um would you suggest that hr is sensitized towards mental health problems first and if so how can the leadership of corporates help in this initiative um i think so i think if hr is the first point of call for people in your organization to go to for help then they need to be sensitized uh you have to look at uh people who are working for you as human beings yes they are involved in your work but they have a life as well and you have they have to balance both elements so that sensitivity is important not to assume that uh, your human resources the only thing they do is work for you uh and to acknowledge that life can happen and you know treat them like a human being so i think that sensitivity training and that should and that sensitivity training can only come if the leadership acknowledges the importance of it and they also develop rules and regulations that support this uh because hr on their own can't do it if the leadership doesn't support them so mm-hmm. i guess the sensitization will initially have to start with your leadership and then only get hr sensitization help mm-hmm. and i think this also uh, it sort of answers the the other question that i'm reading here which is that uh, imran shared that it's difficult for employees to speak to employers how can employees start that conversation of their needs of difficulty with mental health if their employer doesn't initiate it first and i think this really highlights i mean it's a difficult question it's a difficult situation because there's fear of losing your job there's fear of so many things 
Uh, and so I think it is related to the, the it, again, it just, I think, points and highlights the need to um, address this problem at all levels, you know, so the HR, as well as the leadership, as well as employees. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question, um, which is that, um, how, can, uh, how can one, how one caters to employees who is having mental health issues and is reluctant to ask his or her employer, even if the program is available in the organization? Um, is there any way activity which can identify such employees? Um, I think one of the things I, I, I can, if I can just um, be rude and answer this myself, I think that one of the things really that we're trying to do through uh, IRD's GROW program and some of the other work that we've done really is to create that space that Sahar had talked about, that Imran had also highlighted, uh, to create that space that and, and the awareness that this is a safe space where even if your employer is not on par, you can still talk about it. And, you know, it's some of the workshops that we set up and some of the work that we do, we hope to address this, this exact question. Um, I'm going to go on to the next one. This is for Imran. Um, Imran, what can organizations like IRD and others do to convince corporates to start investing? What should be the first convincing step? Um, I think they have to meet the leadership of that organization and the leadership has to be convinced uh, within that organization. Uh, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory when IRD comes over um, the toolkit that they have, when they have a discussion um, and they need to have an open discussion I think the one place where I would maybe um, also tell IRD that maybe they should have more statistics with them, right? Um, there needs to be a lot more research in the corporate sector, um, uh, which is something that because I'm a numbers person. So if there were statistics that were brought to me that made sense in correlation with my sort of uh, uh, position and how I govern the organization and what uh, improvement benchmarks it can bring in. Again, look, being very selfish, right? Uh, the corporate needs a hook. There's no corporate that's a for-profit organization that's going to do something without anywhere. Uh, it's not that everyone cares about uh, employee welfare, well-being, but if it's sort of pitched in a certain way whereby uh, it's beneficial for the employees because at the end of the day, we're doing it for the people as well as it's intrinsically beneficial for the organization, I think that would create a great starting point for a dialogue. And if that space opens up, I think the leadership will get convinced extremely easily and then everything else can follow through. So as a follow up to this, and because you said you're a numbers person, I'm going to jump to uh, Amir, Dr. Amir's question. What price should a business pay for a happy employee? <laughs> what price should a business pay for a happy employee? Um, depends on how effective the employee is. No, no, that's a, that's a joke. But I think... <laughs> Uh, a happy employee, there, there are a lot of intrinsic values, right? And I think that's why the, this is the reason why we're having this conversation. Um, I personally, I can speak for myself. Um, we've seen that if an employee is satisfied and he is not worried about uh, things at home or what he's dealing with on uh, with his mental state, etc., cetera, um, we feel that the productivity output is far greater than someone who's uh, who's worried about um, his own mental well-being as well as the pressures that he has uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. If those can be alleviated, I think me as an employer, um, uh, I'd be willing to pay uh, as much as is required to actually have that set up. Um, and, I'm, I, and, I, and I'm telling you, company culture is created with the people that you have. And so if there's a bunch of happy people in an organization, the organization itself intrinsically will have a extremely exciting culture and good culture promotes good governance, good governance promotes great companies. So it's all linked together. Great. Um, I'm just gonna take one or two more questions. There are a lot and I hope that we can maybe separately respond to some of them. Um, one of the big questions that is always on everybody's mind is the issue of sustainability. Um, what do you both think are ways to ensure the sustainability of some of the work that we're talking about in terms of car shifting and, and just trying to trying to address the mental health gap? Sahar, do you, do you want to take a shot at this? So I think task shifting is sustainable. Uh, it's uh, cost effective. Um, it's, uh, you, you're using the resources available to you and you have to train them and then the train then 
those the ones who are trained can train the next group and so on and so forth so it is extremely sustainable because it is cost effective and you're using this the resources that are available to you so for example i work in academia we would in task shifting we would be using our own students and you know if a university is working the students won't dry up and if the first batch is well trained then that can train the next batch and so on and so forth and that is that is sustainable and extremely cost effective what isn't sustainable is hiring a lot of uh, counselors or trying to hire like psychiatrists psychologists and therapists etc so that's not sustainable because that requires a lot of cost you are increasing the amount of people who are working for you etc so that in the long run will not work but some things like task shifting where you're finding your own solutions which are cost effective and using your own resources those are sustainable and manageable and really good uh, solutions to the mental health need and shortages so oh, yeah. Great. Okay, so I apologize to the audience. I won't be able to take all of the questions, um, but these were great questions, and I hope that, as I said, we can separately reach out and have to address them. And and some people who have asked for what can be done for employees' mental health, I hope that IRD is able to respond to that as well. So, um, I, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about has been related to the needs of the corporate sector, needs of employer employees, needs of students, teachers, faculties, parents, a lot of groups. Um, I think one of the one of the critical components is the actual in the task shifting approach is actually the counselors themselves, the people who are actually delivering um, the mental health support. And in in as we are trying to um, as we are trying to address the mental health gap, and especially in line with this year's mental health theme, which is mental health in an unequal world. We're kind of looking at all of the disparities and inequalities that are present everywhere and where we can fit those in. And I think that as counselors, we often see that there's a lot that, in addition to just the counseling, there's a lot that they gain from it as well. So I just want to, again, just show a quick video, um, it just, which is highlighting um, some of the benefits that the task shifting model has had on our counselors um, in our experience. So a very quick video, and then we can do closing remarks. मुझे अपनी शख्सियत पे इसका ये असर नजर आया है कि मैं गुस्सा बहुत ज़्यादा करती थी और तो मैं बहुत कम करती हूँ और पॉजिटिव सोचती हूँ बहुत ज़्यादा जबकि पहले मैं ऐसी बिल्कुल नहीं थी अब मैं बहुत ज़्यादा चेंज हो गई मैंने कभी इस तरह की चीज़ें की नहीं थी मीन टू से कि मैंने कभी लोगों का ख्याल नहीं रखा मैंने कभी लोगों के बारे में सोचा ही नहीं था बट नाव मैं सोच समझता हूँ कि मैं शायद पहले पैदा ही नहीं हुआ था अब मैं पैदा हूँ मैं डिसीशन जो है नहीं ले पाता था ट्रेनिंग के दौरान जो हमारी ट्रेनिंग हुई मेम सभा ने जो हमें पढ़ाया दोस्तों के साथ जो डिस्कस किया उस लिहाज से जो है ना मैं अब जो एक आराम से सही डिसीजन ले सकता हूँ इमोशनली बहुत ज़्यादा स्ट्रॉन्ग हो गई हूँ क्योंकि पहले लगता था कि छोटे छोटे प्रॉब्लम्स अगर किसी के मैं देखती थी तो मुझे रोना बहुत जल्दी आ जाता था लेकिन अब यहाँ पर आकर इतने सारे प्रॉब्लम्स पेशेंट्स के देखे तो मैं समझती हूँ कि मैं जो मेरी इनर सेल्फ है और ज़्यादा स्ट्रॉन्ग हो गई है और इन फ्यूचर में इससे भी ज़्यादा मुश्किल काम करने के काबिल हो गई So uh, we have a couple of minutes left. I would like to invite each of our panelists, perhaps, to share some closing remarks before we end. Imran. Um, so I had this great idea, right? That I, we could end off on this note. So just like you guys are, and by the way, this is the first time I'm hearing this word task shifting, right? And that too for therapy. Um, so so I feel like the way you guys are going about doing task shifting with counselors, or it's like teach the trainer, or or or, or yeah. I think it's teach the trainer program kind of right. Uh, you guys should use the same philosophy when it comes to leadership within the organization, right? So my peers, if they heard from me about a program like IRD, I think they'd be a lot more receptive and open up to it. So um, one idea of actually making awareness regarding this program and the toolkit, etc., or just uh, the importance of counseling at the workplace. Uh, could start off by gathering a few like-minded um, uh, CEOs or uh, leadership 
uh, roles within an organization, uh, putting them in a room, training them all together and asking them to speak on behalf of this program. And I think that would go a long way. So, you know, task shifting, but from the other side of the spectrum. And I think that would work really well for this because uh, ever since you guys had approached me, I'd been talking to a lot of other people within other organizations. Um, and I think there was a lot of receptiveness because there is a lot of common problems that are inflicting organizations at the corporate level. Uh, and everyone's thinking along these lines, but they've never had any sort of handholding uh, regarding counseling, et cetera. Um, therefore, I think that's the one point that I would make. Um, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Sahar? Uh, I think Imran has a really good idea there uh, of, of going to the leaders and training them first. Uh, I'm going to try to end it with something positive. But, I mean, I think the whole talk has been positive. Uh, so being in academia, I had uh, this one student. Um, she was older and she had left her schooling incomplete after school, you know, she didn't continue because she'd been told that, you know, she's not smart enough. She'd had problems with her teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And so in her late forties, she wanted to join university. And she was very apprehensive that I'm too old to do this. And she came in and she got in and she was very eager, but her work wasn't up that good, you know, even in the first year. So we we worked with her, she got tested, and we found out that she had some learning differences. We put in the right changes for her, and she started excelling. So, you know, those years of, uh, you know, her battering her self-esteem took for being called not smart enough, not good enough for university, those were just simple. If she'd been tested, and those things had been put into place, her entire educational journey would have been so different and so positive. And that impact on her self-esteem would have been so positive. And two days ago, I got an email from her telling me she'd completed her PhD. Mm -hmm. And she's becoming a teacher. And, you know, for me, that was because we worked with, like, her story was ve is very inspirational for me. But she, again, I think uh, this links with what Imran was saying. She herself has gone on to bring other older students back into academia mm -hmm. by telling them that don't be afraid. It's not about you. It's about the system. And if you get tested and you know what differences there are and things are put into place, this won't be like school for you. And so a lot of other students have come just because of her sharing that experience. And I mean, it's that that I think is the positive that that makes me happy about what I do. I feel, you know, teaching and just seeing that because it's not just getting the degree. It's about how it's also changing their self-esteem and their self-image of what they thought they were like and what now they feel they can achieve. And it also changes the jobs and their future, et cetera, as well. So I feel like, you know, things like this are extremely important because they have a huge, huge impact. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you for coming here today and to all of our, uh, to our audience for listening in and for, um, for asking these excellent questions. At, at IRD, we're very excited about the potential. We're excited about the work that we've done uh, in the, in, with our community-based uh, task shifting model with all of the counselors that we have trained that we've integrated within primary care but also are now, uh, are now being able to provide support to uh, the corporate sector and particularly blue collar workers, because that is also some, a group that is typically ignored because there are so few health professionals, they tend to um, be able to have services to address white collar workers. So we're using the task shifting approach to cast a wider net through the corporate sector in being able to increase our access. And we're really happy to have partners such as yourselves, BlueX and, um, and Sahar yourself as well at IBA. And to kind of think through together what are ways in which we can, you know, increase access even further. What are some of the innovative ideas like Imran, what you also just talked about, having leadership as ambassadors for mental health, you know? And what are different ways we can take the program further and so we're really looking forward to it very much. Thank you both. We will definitely be in touch. And I hope that we can um, do good work together. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.